great pleasure to welcome you today um, and thank you for taking the time. You're all sitting in front of your screens and looking forward to learning more about the future of textiles right now. Um, but I'd like you to start by kind of taking a moment and just um, looking down at yourself and feeling what you're wearing. What are you wearing today? What materials are you sitting on? What materials are you looking at in your space? Do you have pet tapestries like I do? Um, what are you surrounded by? And just imagine how different our interaction would be today if the textiles on your body and in your body sometimes um, and in your surroundings adapted to your current state and needs, or if they communicated with you and your computer and our others in this vir virtual space that we're in right now. And just imagine what, might that, what that might mean for our environment and our relationship with nature. So I'm so happy to be exploring these questions and many more all around the future of textiles and the fabric of time today with you all at this laser talk. My name is Alexandra Muller-Krapan, and I am the head of art, the arts programming here at Swiss Next Boston, the Swiss Science and Technology Consulate that focuses on creating networks between Switzerland and the US in the areas of education, research, innovation, and the arts. We've partnered with Sci Art Initiative to bring laser to Boston because these events embody the interdisciplinary dialogue and connection that we so value at Swiss Next. We have three wonderful speakers for you today who will be sharing with their work with you. Nina Bachmann, Head of Technology and Environment at the Swiss Textiles Association and Interim Executive Director of EcoSwiss. Yuli Fuentes Medel, Program Manager of Fiber Technologies at MIT and advisor at the MIT Innovation Initiative and the Closed Loop Partners. And Jenny Sabin, Architect and Professor of Architecture at Cornell University. Um, and we very much look forward to all three of those talks. And I just um, am going to put in a little plug here since we all really miss the networking part um, of our in-person laser talks that have, unfortunately right now are not possible. We will have the opportunity for more personal exchanges today um, and kind of space to discuss them in person in this month's edition of Crosslinks, which is a networking platform that we host at Swissnext um, on the platform called Remo. This will give us the chance to unwind, chat, and weave some new connections with our other laser attendees and members of the Swiss Next Network. You'll be able to sign up uh, for the networking on Remo right after this event um, in the link that my colleague Lemon is sharing with you right now. It's very easy to navigate. It's all browser-based, so there's no need to download anything. Just sign up during this event or at the end, we'll repost the link as well. Um, now let's take it away. Julia from SciArt Initiative will give you a little intro to SciArt and laser, and then she has the pleasure of introducing our speakers. Thank you so much, Alex, and thank you to everyone who has joined us today um, from, I imagine, the United States, but also around the world. Uh, so I look forward to hearing from you all and getting to know some of you in crosslinks after this event. Um, so my name is Julia Buntain Howell. I am the founding director of SIRE Initiative, which is a US-based nonprofit dedicated to bridging the gulf between the arts and sciences. We have a number of programs that uh, work towards this end, and one of the programs that we co-run with Swiss Next Boston is LASER. Uh, LASER is a program of Leonardo Art, um, of the Leonardo Group. It stands for Leonardo Art Science Evening Rendezvous, although of course many lasers don't take place during the evening. <laughs> and LASER was initiated in California by Leonardo, which is the International Society for the Arts, Sciences, and Technology. LASER talks have grown to become an international program of evening and otherwise gatherings that bring artists, scientists, and practitioners of all fields together for informal presentations and conversations with engaged audiences. So we are thrilled to have our three amazing speakers here with you today to talk about their points of view on the fabric of time. LASER is really about bringing together different um, professionals from different uh, disciplines to talk about a common theme, but through their own lenses and showing their work that's made with their own tools. So our first speaker today will be Nina Bachman. Nina Bachman is head of technology and sustainability at the Swiss 
Textiles Association, a member-based organization committed to ensuring that the Swiss textiles industry stays internationally competitive, representing the interests of over 200 companies in the industry. Nina creates links between the industry and academic research and supports members in environmental and energy-related issues. She also serves as the Interim Executive Director of EcoSwiss, the Organization of Swiss Businesses for Environmental Protection, Occupational Safety, and Health Protection. She holds a Master's of Science in Environmental Sciences from ETH Zurich and a Master in Public and Nonprofit Management from Lucerne University of Applied Sciences and Arts. Nina, I will let you take it away. Thank you, Julia, for this uh, nice introduction. I just start my, my presentation about um, textile circle economy in Switzerland or sustainability in Switzerland. Maybe just um, to begin with a, a short introduction about Swiss textiles. You already said that, Julia, but um, who are we? What are we doing? We have 200 SMEs mostly. Um, companies, textile companies that are our members, we are member financed. So we do uh, services for our members and we have different activities in different topics. One of them is sustainability and one of them is research and then um, head of both these really interesting co topics which are coming closer and closer together at the moment. Um, all of our SMEs are active in international markets and they have production in Switzerland, but this is changing a lot, especially at the moment. Um, production is going international for most of our members. Our members do not make clothing, they do high fashion. So we see here Rihanna and uh, George Clooney and his wife uh, wearing um, broadery from St. Gallen, which is a place um, here near to Zurich. It was produced in Switzerland. And we have not only we are not only active in the fashion sector, we are also a lot of our members are doing high tech. For example, here you see for the Formula One. Um, Nina, so, this is yeah? Sorry, we just can't see your slides right now. Um, could you okay. make sure to share your screen? Thanks uh, so much. Yes, sorry, I try again, maybe. Um, can you see it now or not yet? Yes, now yes. we can see okay. it. Okay, perfect. Sorry. Um, yes, I. Uh, our members just to also, uh, this was the picture I showed before, the high fashion picture, and then we have the high tech picture. Um, what our members do here, the production of Formula One or, or um, mobility textiles, which you see on the left and on the right side. So sustainability at Swiss Texas is really, it. I think in the last three to four years, it became the most important topic here in Switzerland. Um, we established different services for our members, for the textile companies. We have consulting services, for example. We have consulting for sustainability standards, which are quite numerous in, in textile. As you might know, then we have uh, projects uh, where we look at the CO2 emissions in the in the supply chain of the Swiss textile companies, and we do consulting for due diligence, especially um, for the US OSCD uh, due diligence guidelines, which will which might become regulation also in Switzerland within the next three weeks. Um, it will be voted, it's a popular initiative, which will be voted within three weeks. Then we have lobbying activities. We are active in politics uh, for CO2 emission regulation, mandatory due diligence and so on. And we have a lot of events, of course, at the moment also in the vir virtual space, um, not in the physical space, but, and we have also courses or webinars um, at the moment, more webinars, of course. But I think the most important um, activities or maybe also the long-term activities in sustainability sustainability are our research initiatives we have several sustainability research initiatives in switzerland which we which are financed partially 
by us, but also by, by Swiss companies. We have, for example, with EMPA St. Gallen, we have a project uh, which looks at endlessly recyclable fiber through a new spinning process. Then also with EMPA St. Gallen, with another team, I, we had made a study about the textile waste streams of pre-consumed textile waste, that means the textile waste from production, which could then be recycled or, or um, could then be given to a, to a closed loop process. We are actually at the moment working at this project. Then we had a, a, we are having a project or finance project, uh, Tech Cycle 4.0. It's close, it's a closing the loop project for clothing, um, post-consumer clothing with Hochschule Luzern. And then we are of course active in the EU in the recycling hubs initiative where um, you wants to make five recycling hubs on on the whole uh, eu regions um, where all partners should stay together to make recycling of clothing easier than at the moment where there is no technical technological solution and then we have a blockchain project um, for traceability in the supply chain but this is at the moment due to COVID quite uh, it stopped but we, i hope we can we take the action on this really interesting international project also. So what are the opportunities I see at the moment? I think at the moment really the time is now, that's what I hear often for companies, the time is now regarding sustainability. Um, we have here in, in Switzerland worldwide le leading research institutes and the for closing the loop for the circular economy, we have one system implemented already, and that is the separate collection of textile waste, which is implemented in Switzerland just for, for 10 to 20 years. So it re it's really well established. We have the collecting and sorting industry here. Um, and industry waste is punished with a fee. So, so indust indust industries really want to make separate collection. Um, I think that it's one good opportunity, but of course, it's not the solution to all. And then we have quite strong regulation and the controlling by the authorities. So um, companies are really attracted to, to have sustainable, to make sustainable businesses. But of course, like in other countries, we also have difficulties. We do not have no complete textile supply chain within Switzerland. Um, we have the customers, we have the producers, and we have the brands, but they are not connected within one supply chain. So we have a lot of um, traders or, or people importing textiles, and the customers buy textiles which are imported, and the producers here in Switzerland sell their products in, on international markets, so they do not have anything in common, which makes projects quite, quite hard to, to, to get all at one table. And then, of course, we have the corona situation. Uh, priorities are at the moment on economical factors, welfare, and factories are closing at the moment. So some projects are also were stopped due to financial issues, corona issues. And um, one big issue, of course, uh, when closing the loop is the technical, the, the lack of technical solutions for, for closing the loop. Um, the need for big investments and low return at the beginning. That's, that's one of our challenges we, we face now, but I hope we can uh, go through this. Now, our goals, our real realistic goals, I have to say, um, is that I really think that we should now get all our members on board on the sustainability track. I think we are on a good way, but we have to, to keep engaged. And then um, I hope that we can keep the engagement of our forerunner members in the sustainability research project although they have difficulties with corona at the moment um, we want to broaden our networks and engagement with other stakeholders through our initiative sustainable textile switzerland so that's also i'm quite pleased uh, to can to to be able to talk here because we want really uh, with its initiative Sustainable Texas Switzerland 2030, we want to reach SDGs uh, faster than, than without partnerships. So I think partnerships are really the key of all. And one of my visions is, but maybe it's still far away, is to install a pilot recycling plant for, for post-consumer waste. But this is, might be just a dream within the next three to five years. But we will see. Maybe we will 
which is cool. So I thank you very much. Maybe you have some questions. I am. I'll be glad to answer them now or at the end of the of the laser talks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nina, for the fascinating talk and peer into the world of Swiss textiles. Um, unless there are any questions out there, um, of course, you can always submit them later on through the Q&A chat box at the bottom of your Zoom window. Uh, we will move on to our second speaker. Okay, give me one moment. Our next speaker is Yuli Fuentes Medell. Dr. Yuli Fuentes Medell is a catalyst of creative ideas and ecosystem builder, and she works at MIT as program manager of fiber technologies. She is also the founder of Value of Science and advisor to venture fund closed loop partners. She created DScience, a global collective of designers, scientists, and technologists, connecting the world of science and design as one. She graduated with a PhD in biomedical sciences from MIT's medical group, medical school, and trained at the MIT Sloan School in Technology, Innovation, and Entrepreneurship. Yuli is energetically involved in fostering international innovation ecosystem and careers diversity, currently serving as president of the board of the Chile Massachusetts Alliance to support international exchange of investment, technological business, talent, and social impact. She is no stranger to international network building and collaboration in innovation, tech, and science. Trained as a biochemist at the University of Concepcion in her native Chile, she is constantly in the search of opportunity to support young talent and technologies that need to make an impact in global markets. I will let you take it away, Yuli. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, excellent. Uh, meantime, I do the share screen. I wanna, yeah, there we go. One anecdote, science art. Uh, when I did the science, you guys were the first one who reached out. We wanna know more, what are you doing? Uh, and we end up with 65 teams in 40 different, 47 different cities doing fashion and science. So thank you for that. And now we're back here. So thank you for the invitation. Um, the goal that I was asked to give you is a flavor of what's going on in Boston. I was happy to hear what Nina was saying uh, from the other side of the pond. So sustainable fabrics at MIT and Boston at large. So I'm going to speak about MIT, but to do that, I, I wanted to take you to the map of Massachusetts uh, and kind of bring you home on where we are now working from home, but here we are. Massachusetts is a highly concentrated hub of innovation. And if you see here, most of the innovation activity happens across the, the Boston area. And we have hundreds of universities uh, investment in the research and development. So things that happen in Massachusetts are always with the tech heavy impact um, and that uh, it is part of our DNA here. Uh, one of the particular geographies that where MIT is located is Kendall Square. And if you guys have been in Boston or the ones that are uh, launching here from Boston, MIT is all this pink area. It's a land of innovation. But then it's around Kendall Square of all these companies and pharma and IT that really creates like once in a planet uh, space to create uh, different types of innovation. So the mission of the Institute is to advance knowledge, educate students in science, technology, and other areas uh, that will take us to the future centuries. And, and that speaks loud on what's going on in terms of people. Uh, MIT has uh, a pride of 89, for example, Nobel Prize winners. And we produce about 375 patents a year. Let's check that number with COVID, but that's the, the average. Uh, and if you think about the students, uh, 30,000 of them are crea have created active companies. So it's in DNA of MIT 
to not only know knowledge, but also to produce an economy of innovation that is good not only for Massachusetts, but for the world. And if you just compare as a fun fact, the GDP of all those companies total, total is, 10 is the 10 largest economy in the world. So MIT is really proud of that. We also know that technology is one piece of the puzzle. Uh, and I, I think that's kind of the philosophy I was training MIT to do when I launched Value of Science, that industries have their own challenges, consumers they have their own needs and preparations, and the technological solutions live in a network of all those conversations. And I think particularly for fibers, uh, we have taken an approach, uh, which is the, the, the initiatives I'm leading, in thinking, yes, you can have all the objectives of what a fiber is and really fiber centric, but those fibers have to be in balance with what we're doing with humans and what we're doing with the planet. And then a line down there, the innovation research has to uh, create the supply chain that goes from the tangible to digital and most likely from manufacturing to the information that is, is, is revealed out of that creation of fibers. So I think that in this is nutshell the philosophy we're taking in how we're creating portfolios of fibers in MIT. Not only that, but MIT has a history. Um, in, 19, in the 100s, uh, this is a beautiful picture. I'm, I'm really a fan of it. Professor Edward Schwartz created the first textile department and it was the first time that in the States before all the manufacturing went to the Carolinas, took a fiber under the microscope. So MIT participated creating the first textile department in the United States when all that was happening in the 900s. And 2016 was a pivoting point for MIT to really rejoin the conversation. Many years have happened, and it was when Professor Joel Fink created a fiber that is called the multi-layer material fiber that gave rise to a whole new uh, idea of how fibers are going to play in augmentation for humans. Uh, his process uh, took a place and here you can see uh, as a demo, uh, doesn't mean we're going to be all wearing LEDs, but it's a, basically the fiber in itself uh, can have a computer inside the unit. So you could create completely different type of textiles that now have the computational capacity of your computer and now you're watching this. Uh, that allows MIT to be part and create this nonprofit, which is, I encourage you to look at, which is called AFOA, that brings, uh, that is uh, the Manufacturing Institute uh, uh, for United States to kind of rethink what are we going to do with the fibers. Uh, you can see here there is a vast a number of companies that are members and a is from MIT headquarters, the engine for the, the country to kind of rethink what is going to be the fiber of the future, never mind uh, what are we going to be doing uh, for sustainability, which is questions that are still ongoing with these technologies. For MIT, and this is a view from the Domo uh, in MIT and the river and looking at Boston, our fashion style is, looks most likely like this. Uh, we have been doing most of the fashion that goes to aerospace. Uh, we can be heavy participants. And we have, for example, Professor Newman, who is designing the biospace suit that is gonna take us to Mars. How is that valuable for the apparel space or for the development of textiles? It's an extreme design condition that imagine if you have to take one piece of clothing for a spaceship, planet Earth is also our own spaceship. So the thinking and the development of any material in that mindset will serve people in how we are designing clothing back here in Earth. The other fashion style is uh, the Professor uh, Huker, who is a professor who does the biomechatronics, right? So he once, uh, when young, uh, lost his extremities and he said, well, how can I build my own uh, legs uh, and connect them with my nervous system? Therefore, I'm not longer in disability, rather that I'm in capability and augmentation. So, the mindset of MIT research really goes into how can we explore the extension of humankind. 
We have for, uh, also Professor Neri Oxman, uh, who has worked in, uh, and many of you who are here, uh, we're big fans of her work, where she's been merging architecture and, and biomaterials. Uh, and projects that uh, her work ha has executed is to take the 3D printing now with, with materials that uh, challenge uh, the materiality of the elements, the biodegradability of those elements, but in the scales that in the future we can see for other manufacturers. And I'm looking forward for Jenny's uh, uh, to tell a story that we will see. Another professor that is also been working with, uh, with textiles and thinking in the textile as a programmable unit is Professor Sky, Skylar Tibbetts, who basically, for example, designed this shoe that is, a complete, is one piece of a textile, but because he is now able to program the textile in an origami fashion, it became a shoe. So challenging really the manufacturing process that today we know for the textile industry changing completely from what we think it should go into needing woven, but building a product on the go. And potentially using even robotics, right? So some of the projects that they have, they've been executing is that how we merge this intersection of technology with robotics and with the textile itself. And uh, for example, here it's a, it's a sweater that you can see is changing shape after the fact it's been manufactured because the robots can do so and change color. Uh, tell me how I'm doing on time because I want to also take the time to think about the big space uh, on, on Boston. Uh, you're, fine. you're fine in time. Um, could you just check if something's clicking against your mic? There's a clicking sound that everyone can hear. Oh, I'm sorry. That's good. Thank you for that. Uh, I think it's my jacket phone. I'm just gonna open it. Thanks so much. Uh, there? Yeah, now I'm, I'm a little bit more naked, but Mike, fine. <laughs> okay, so to summarize uh, what's going on in MIT, we're really working in different buckets. Material science research, rethinking the manufacturing technologies, and rethinking the metrics where we're, how we are going to build the life cycle assessment for textiles. Uh, and in that, uh, really driven by the mitigation of uh, gas emissions globally, and of course, the CO2 problems that everyone is facing. But we, we're not doing this as a, in a vacuum. We're doing it in a holistic way where everything takes part and we're creating something uh, that considers all these problems and the interception of the problems as a whole blueprint for the future of the fabric uh, that we want to create. Um, some of the showcase from Massachusetts back into what's going on, one of the iconic companies that came out out of MIT is Ministry of Supply, that they use it, all the knowledge that's been used in the spacesuit to build a company that now uh, has the capability to kind of create performance, but in, in the suit, and thinking in the technologies that need to go behind when every single man is using a suit, could you run a marathon with it? But because now we know the capabilities for a spacesuit, you can bring that to planet Earth. Innovations like nervous system, where they were thinking in, in the additive manufacturing, how can you bring 3D printing to the form of a, of a dress or voxel, which is a Harvard innovation that you could be really accurate in the 3D printing of a shoe and using just the material that uh, is needed to manufacture a, a shoe. So no waste in the process. So also reminding you that uh, Boston is the house of Rebook and they just launched this sneaker that is biocompostable. And I think they can really do that because we are in a network of people that is really thinking differently about what we will do with the future of fabrics. Another company is Jinko who has been taking a uh, synthetic biology to develop uh, organisms. And it's literally like a farm of organism that will be the raw material for future things that are gonna be built in different markets. But this is a beautiful demonstration of how they're thinking about textiles and how they're incorporating bacteria into the process. And some exhibitions they do with interactions between scientists and artists, and in this case, uh, Dr. Nesei, and this beautiful collection that she created uh, with bacterial pigments and how could you think in industrializing? And not only that, but for the perfume space, 
this project that Jinko created was how can you bring a sense from extinct flowers because now you have the DNA of the flower and bring it back to 2020 where you can have a perfume of a flower that didn't exist. And that's only been done because you can play with the synthetic biology of the plants. Cotton, we have this company called Gali in our headquarters in Boston. Gali is thinking, how can we grow cotton in the lab and build it from the basics of with the biotechnology knowledge that Massachusetts has and now bring it to the biotechnology of plants. And silk, we have Professor um, Aminetto in the Tuff University who has developed a whole platform of uses and forms of silk for different space, both in apparel and also in the medical space. And some of the patents have created companies like Evolve by Nature who is a company that is taking silk and bringing it back to the cosmetic space. So to finish, I wanna say textiles is an industry that touches every human in the planet. We do have an opportunity to reinvent it. And I'm so excited that you guys invited me to talk here and looking forward for your questions. Uh, and that is my contact info uh, for future, if anybody has a question. Thank you so much, Yuli. It's always good to hear about what's going on at MIT and its variety of interesting projects. Alex, are there any questions out there we should take now or should we um, continue on to Jenny and take some questions at the end? Yes, we have one question here from Hannah Koch or Koch. Um, she asks, do you have numbers of how many of these 30,000 companies from MIT and textile companies um, are in the Boston area? Uh, okay, so um, that number is a report written by Professor Ed Roberts. Uh, it's a famous report that was written back in, it's a now old, 2018. 18. That, is, that is not the total number of textile companies. That was an initial set on all the companies that MIT has created. Uh, the number of textile companies, of course, is reduced. And right now with the FAFOA initiative and with the Fabric Hub initiative, we are rebumping our pipeline of textile-based companies. Thanks so much. And we'll keep feeding you all questions as I come in from the audience. Please feel free to ask any questions you have to any of the speakers in our Q&A function. Okay, and last but not least, we will move on to Jenny Sabin. Jenny Sabin is the Arthur L. and Isabel B. Weisenberger Professor in Architecture and Associate Dean for Design Initiatives at Cornell College of Architecture, Art and Planning. There she established a new advanced research degree in matter design computation. She is also the principal of Jenny Sabin Studio, an experimental architectural design studio based in Ithaca, New York, and director of the Sabin Lab at Cornell. Jenny's work investigates the intersections of architecture and science and applies insights and theories from biology and mathematics to the design of responsive material structures and adaptive architecture. Sabin holds degrees in ceramics and interdisciplinary visual art from the University of Washington and a Master of Architecture from the University of Pennsylvania. She was awarded a Pew Fellowship in the Arts in 2010 and was named a USA Knight Fellow in Architecture. In 2014, she was awarded the prestigious Architectural League Prize. I will hand it over to you, Jenny. Thank you so much, Julia. Uh, it's a pleasure to take part in uh, this fantastic uh, event, the Laser Talks, um, really amazing talks so far. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. And does that look okay on everybody else's end? Yep, perfect. Great, fantastic. So I will be talking about biosynthetic architecture and the future of adaptive textiles. So how do we start? Um, how do we start both our research projects and applied projects? Uh, we frequently start with very simple parts and components, uh, as well as very simple rules that through feedback and iteration produce much more complex spatial holes.
This interest probes the productive tinkering and misuse of digital fabrication machines with a focus on problem generation over problem solving. Uh, we look to alternate industries, uh, importantly textiles, as well as robotics and automation. This is informed by issues of craft and making to produce bio-inspired material systems and software design tools that have the capacity to facilitate embedded expressions in our built environments. Importantly, we also contribute to fundamental science. Um, it has never been about uh, bringing architects and designers into a scientific environment uh, to create pseudoscientists or vice versa, but to come together collaboratively around common questions and problems. And these are some of the recent publications um, as well as older publications that we have participated on. We ask, how might buildings behave more like organisms responding to and adapting to their built environments? I believe that in the not so distant future, materials will not just be elements and things in buildings, but they will generate immersive spaces, acting upon and responding to affordances in our built environments. Like the cells in our bodies, sensors and imagers will learn and adapt, making materials not only smart, but also aware, sensate, and beautiful. One of my longtime collaborators, Dr. Peter Lloyd-Jones, uh, introduced to me very early on the extracellular matrix. Uh, he is trained as a matrix biologist, and we started a hybrid research and design unit called Lab Studio in 2006 when I was teaching at the University of Pennsylvania. And what this presented to me very early on is a series of very powerful ecological thinking models uh, stemming from natural systems and specifically matrix biology and bringing that into design and applied projects as a way of thinking systemically about relationships and importantly, thinking about how context or environment specifies form, function, and structure. And so we were specifically looking at how the ECM, the extracellular matrix, acts upon and alters DNA as a series of reciprocal feedback loops. So I'm going to focus on just two projects in our short uh, talk uh, with a specific focus on textile tectonics and adaptive environments, building upon that fundamental question that I just posed, but also looking at how we might design and enhance architecture with the bioarchitecture and behavior of our own bodies and local environments. So I'd like to focus on Lumen, uh, which is a project that I won by commission, uh, by a competition as part of the Young Architects Program in 2017. Uh, the Young Architects Program has been in place for about 20 years, uh, and we were very fortunate uh, to be shortlisted and then to win the competition. And as, as you can see in this slide, uh, to pull off uh, this complex uh, project in a very short amount of time with what I'll call a, a um, creatively, uh, uh, a creative budget. Uh, it takes an army of people, students, my senior designers, collaborators, uh, contractors, and beyond. When I embarked upon designing and eventually fabricating Lumen, I, I was building upon years of work uh, specifically looking at uh, textile fabrication and more specifically looking at what's called whole garment, um, a process innovated by Shima Siki, uh, who I've been collaborating with uh, since 2012. And this collaboration came forth uh, through a commission uh, coming to me from Nike. Uh, in 2012, they formed the Flyknit Collective and they were about to launch uh, a new technology, now very familiar with all of us, uh, the Flyknit, and they invited six uh, designers and architects uh, to respond to the core benefits of the Flyknit technology, including lightness, sustainability, form fitting, uh, performance, and so on. And it was during the production of this pavilion that I started to work with high-tech responsive fibers, uh, building upon years of research uh, across disciplinary boundaries, uh, designing with light and energy, and specifically wor working with uh, photoluminescent fibers, uh, fibers that absorb UV 
and then release that back as light, as well as solar active fibers, uh, which change color in the presence of the sun or a UV source. Later, I was fortunate to receive another commission from the Cooper Hewitt Design Museum, uh, where I began to form a bridge uh, between the multiple years of deep investigation into multicellular structures uh, with Peter and in the context of Lab Studio, not simply mimicking or translating what might be a beautiful cellular form into a built space, uh, into a materialized architecture, uh, but to take those relationships, part to whole relationships, looking at how surfaces form, are formed uh, by cells, how they bifurcate to form larger forms as a way of thinking systemically in design. At that time, I started working uh, with Arup uh, very closely to really dial in uh, the transmission of tension forces uh, through the complexity of the knit so that we could bring that back to our, our own tools and simulation tools uh, to work in a generative fashion. And these are some images from that project. And so when it came to embarking upon Lumen, I felt very confident uh, that we were ready to take this material system to an altogether uh, radically different scale and to also bring it outside. And this is a view of the large canopy structure uh, in the main courtyard at MoMA PS1 in Long Island City. Uh, to date, this is our most ambitious project, our largest project that we've taken on in the context of adaptive textiles. Uh, I was very interested in how the project would operate as an environment, uh, that it would be very different uh, depending on when you would visit, either during the day or at night, and that people could really take ownership of the project um, in terms of thinking about materiality as being something that's co-produced between ourselves and human perception and the ways that materials are changing and transforming. So we worked with the existing site, uh, both the main courtyard as well as the smaller courtyard. Uh, as part of the brief, uh, you have to also design and fabricate seating. And here you can see some of the spool stools, uh, which were uh, formed from recycled spools. Uh, we deconstructed the tops and the bottoms of the spools uh, to form a, a cog, which was then uh, for the prototypes robotically woven with photolumin photoluminescent microcord and used as both tables and stools that people could move around uh, in, in the installation. Here you can see some of the photoluminescent fibers uh, activated at night, um, which was our, the first time that we were able to actually work with sunlight uh, to develop simulations to understand how the materials would change and also to collaborate with focus lighting to enhance that in the evening hours uh, for events uh, through an integrated lighting system. Uh, here you can see the solar active fibers activated um, that would change these sort of subtle colors throughout the day uh, from pinks to blues to yellows. And some details highlighting how we integrated with the existing matrix of courtyard uh, walls, these concrete walls, uh, tensioning into them, stitching into them, also, as part of the brief, um, they require some element of water. Um, as you can imagine, during the summer months in New York City, it gets quite hot, uh, especially in these courtyard spaces uh, that have no shade. Um, and so we integrated a misting system. Uh, we also integrated uh, some IR infrared sensors uh, that were connected to solenoid valves. Uh, so as you would pass by uh, these uh, misting systems. This was the misting corridor of view from above. It would activate um, the IR sensors and so the whole system would sort of breathe and hiss and it actually worked quite effectively to cool the local microclimate. Uh, here another uh, shot uh, during the evening. Um, you can see again the, the fibers being activated. A view of the smaller courtyard uh, both during the day and at night and a view of one of the three tensegrity towers. Um, the project featured three 42 foot tall tensegrity towers um, strategically located uh, at the center points of the canopy structures to lift them up, um, but also adding a sort of third envelope of um, adaptation to the project. The entire project was designed 
uh, to be adaptive, to move, uh, to take wind and flutter, as well as to finally coordinate how the fibers were transforming through both the day and the night. And I think for me, one of the most exciting aspects of the project, again, was to see how people used it, uh, to see how people uh, really kind of claimed it and made it their own. Um, and these towers uh, were engineered to take live loads, such as people climbing on them. Uh, of course, they were not supposed to, uh, but of course they did, especially during uh, the Saturday warm-up events uh, when MoMA PS1 features uh, live DJs, uh, incredible artists um, invited from around the world uh, to perform. Uh, some of the feedback that I received from visitors included, um, you know, they would talk about how they felt calm. Uh, they told me that they wished uh, Lumen was in the uh, playground of their child's school, or they wished that it was in a hospital space. Um, and so there was something about the biosynthetic nature of the architecture uh, driven by relationships and modes of thinking stemming from the natural world, specifically cellular biology and material science and beyond, uh, that generated moments of transformation, uh, of wonder, of play. Uh, and for me, that's, as an architect, uh, something that continues to drive the work um, as a series of inspirations. Uh, the project held up uh, quite well. Um, these events on Saturdays that featured uh, between five to 7,000 people uh, were incredibly anxiety provoking for myself. Um, uh, I didn't anticipate this many people coming to the project, um, but it held up well and people just really fell in love with Lumen. And this image in the context of the pandemic and the complex time that we're in is, is sort of difficult to, to digest. I, and I, I hope uh, at some point we'll be able to gather uh, like this uh, at MoMA PS1. And so in the last few minutes, I will uh, conclude uh, with a more recent project. Uh, Lumen uh, was, was very popular uh, amongst people that visited the project, but also around the world. Um, she photographed quite well. And uh, we were fortunate to be in the top five most Instagram uh, design projects around the world that year, which was a huge surprise. Um, and it has opened up new avenues in my, pro my practice uh, for experimental work as well as uh, permanent uh, built work. And this project for Microsoft Research as part of their Artists in Residence program uh, is one such project. Uh, Ada uh, was a collaborative project uh, with uh, several research teams at Microsoft Research um, in their Redmond campus in Washington State. And to our knowledge is the first architectural pavilion to integrate uh, AI, artificial intelligence, um, and to integrate that with textile fabrication processes and design methodologies uh, that inform an interactive experience. Uh, for the most part, focused on uh, human sentiment and issues of well-being uh, and our, our relationships with our environments, uh, and ultimately to consider a project that would be human-centered. And so I'm going to play uh, this video just to highlight the project in the last uh, minute or so of my talk. Data is driven by artificial intelligence. It's a project that smiles back at you. The name comes from Ada Lovelace, one of the first computer programmers and the linkages between weaving and computation. Knitting is, is one of the earliest examples of 3D printing, additively layering link by link, row by row material. The project features soft forms that are more feminine versus masculine, and that's a paradigm shift in architecture. The shape of Ada is an ellipsoid. It features a unique exoskeleton composed of a network of fiberglass rods and 3D printed nodes. Every single node is different and has a unique ID attached to it. The 
The interior surface is composed of hundreds of digitally knit cones and cells in a network of webbing. In the center of Ada is a large tensegrity cone composed of a skin of fiber optic cables. Photoluminescent fiber absorbs energy from the lighting and then emits that back as knitted light, as glowing light. But the real magic comes through how people actually engage with it. On the interior soft surface is a whole network of LEDs connected to a network of cameras within the atrium, reading the facial expressions of people in an anonymous way. When Building 99 is very active, the project will be very vibrant and highly transformative. There are moments where it blushes. The hope is that people realize their engagement is actually driving the project that the project begins to gain its own life in the way that it is interacting with people. And so uh, just briefly to highlight um, a few of the details, uh, this is a drawing that showcases the material system uh, and how the semi-rigid exoskeleton um, integrates with the soft uh, surface of the interior composed of digitally knit whole garment uh, cones and cells. Uh, some details of that uh, and then also highlighting the software architecture uh, it was an incredible experience collaborating with teams at Microsoft Research. Um, and here you can see how we worked with the live uh, data feed of um, anonymous uh, patterns picked up by a network of cameras uh, in, the, in, the in the atrium uh, and how that translated to a three-scaled lighting system uh, to integrate and activate the materials. Uh, we were also looking at the ethical aspects of AI, uh, especially in terms of um, you know, the terms that we associate uh, with, with facial pattern recognition as sentiment, uh, and all of this was developed uh, to be parameterized. So every variable could be adjusted in terms of the colors that the light was emitting and, and so on. Uh, some details of the fiber optics. And I'll just conclude with uh, a few points. An important aim of the project uh, is to expand and inspire human engagement. And while artificial intelligence powers the project through the precise narrowing and statistical averaging of data collected from individual and collective facial patterns and voice tones, the architecture of ADA augments emotion through aesthetic experience, thereby opening the range of possible human emotional engagement. And in turn, the project opens new pathways uh, for fundamental research on the use of AI to correlate connections between human sentiment and local environment. Uh, ADA, importantly, will also be used uh, as a platform for researchers to test their data and machine learning algorithms at Microsoft Research. So unlike the pioneering work of Mark Sager, such as his Baby X project that seeks to humanize AI through more, quote, symbiotic relationships between humans and machines, ADA does not appear lifelike. Instead, ADA offers subtle and abstract interactions with humans through space, material, and form to augment and expand our emotional range in a specific context, in this case, an office environment, which in turn affects the probable sentiment being collected as new information. The spaces and environments that we inhabit influence and partially shape who we are and how we are feeling. And through the integration of responsive textile materials and emerging technologies, ADA offers an interface for personalizing architecture to make it more human and reflexive. And so I'll conclude uh, with this last image and I've, I've shown you two projects. Uh, we have a lot of projects ongoing in my lab as well as my practice. Uh, here's where you can find us. Uh, and we've been very fortunate to receive uh, a great deal of support um, from foundations and institutes over the years. Uh, and thanks so much for your attention. Thank you so much, Jenny. Yes, thank you, Jenny. I can attest, I visited Lumen in person and it was both 
beautiful and refreshing. <laughs> no. So um, if I could just ask Nina to turn back on her video as well, we'll take some um, questions from the audience for these last few minutes. Um, so I'd like to start off um, with a question to all of you actually. So you all mentioned in some way or another the importance of cross-sector collaborations and kind of functioning within ecosystems to push forward innovation um, in textiles. Jenny, you mentioned that you worked with Nike and with Microsoft to develop some of these large-scale projects that I'm sure without private sector partners would have been much more difficult to realize. And Yuli, you mentioned how important it is to have this link to Ginkgo Bioworks and Reebok and similar companies in the seaport area um, that then collaborate with MIT. Nina, you also mentioned that it's a, a priority um, in what you do at the Swiss Textiles Association. So I wondered if you could just um, maybe speak to how you create those ecosystems. How do you create those connections for some of the innovators um, and researchers that might be listening today that are wondering, yeah, but how do I get those connections to the private sector? Uh, I can take a step for the use of time. Um, so actually that, that's kind of how my work when I did my postdoc, how do you really build ecosystem uh, to build this connection? And I, I can ask, answer in two realms. One is the truth there is that beyond the technology or the space you're creating, you are building relationships of trust. In the moment that collaboration gets built, uh, literally what the transaction that is happening is trust. And, and that is what allows creativity. That's what allow uh, researchers to work with companies, companies to work with researchers uh, and, and kind of build that uh, pushing the creativity to the level where we create new technologies. Uh, and the second thing I would say is that for the practical specificity of textiles, um, because of my background and, and kind of my, I would use the word architecture, but I'm not an architect, but a system design inside MIT is not only thinking in the material in a vacuum, but thinking with the rest of the community of MIT that this material will do a design and integration. If we need certain metrics in how it's gonna uh, perform for sustainability, is we need the interaction with the humans and the consumers. So being able to build a community that has that channel of communication among themselves, and Boston is famous for that, uh, is critical to kind of push the barriers for what do we want to see for textile. So I would stop there. Any additions from the others? Yeah, maybe I could just uh, jump in here. Um, we made really good experience just um, as we are more the company side of the <laughs> of the project, uh, we made really good experience with just making such um, events where we want to, where we have researchers on stage um, talking about their visions or talking about their projects, and we have companies in the audience. And then we have out um, outside of the events, we have these networking corners where we ha have tables where the research teams present themselves and companies go there and just talk to them on a on a face to face um, interaction and that I think that a lot of projects started there because they really had to talk to each other and then they could just um, exchange contact details and then they they called afterwards and the project started so it's really they they just need to know about each other what they are doing then they see okay we have some connection we have some touch points and that that where the project starts yeah i'll i'll add just a few points um to echo both comments i mean yuli i i completely agree it's the transaction is trust it's always about building trust and you know each successful project and collaboration demonstrates to the next potential collaborator um, you know the success and the, and the trust that has been developed so you know for me it's about those relationships and friendships uh, and and also uh, pushing oneself outside of your sort of comfortable territory um, which I think we're all in good company here on in this laser talk um, 
into other disciplinary spaces and and to come to that that space you know with your area of expertise um, but to be open and um, you know open to conversation and I'll just mention that one of the most important things that my longtime collaborator Peter and I did early on was to spend a year just figuring out how to talk to each other you know and how to communicate and to understand our different structures for how we lead a day how we get funding how we lead projects um, and that was really really important because that was about trust building uh, i would like to add something there which jenny uh, i uh, eat um, two points one is in my private uh, practice uh, when i when i'm with the head of an investor for the fashion industry traditionally the fashion industry is not a collaborative entity you normally are competing for uh characteristics in the company that wants to keep the secrets because that's what makes you a, a really cool brand right so transitioning the fashion industry as a market space to these collaborative practices is essential also for the textiles to see a place and to to kind of uh, make a new face in planet earth to me, it's not surprise, and I know Asta pretty well in Microsoft, that Jenny is doing the AI project with Microsoft because a, a technological company knows that with collaboration, they can push their technology. Uh, but for the textiles, I think um, we still need to kind of build that trust and, and see the economical benefits of why they need to collaborate. Uh, and I think that's a challenge if we put it also out there. 